And today we've got uh, our first talk and our first speaker is uh, Minister Tara Shane, who is uh, a Labour member for Jinandera and the ACT's Minister for Human Rights, uh, Multicultural Affairs, Business uh, and Better Regulation and the Arts. And she's been a passionate advocate for restoring the territory's rights to legislate around um, voluntary assisted dying. So we've asked her here today to speak to us about that issue in particular and some of the progress that's being made right now. Some of you may have seen that there's some exciting things happening. So welcome, Tara, and uh, over to you to tell us about what's going on. Thanks very much. Um, so uh, I'd first like to acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of the land uh, that we're meeting on, which for me today is the Ngunnawal people, and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and to acknowledge the continuing culture and contribution that they make to the life of this city and this region, and to also acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded, and this always was and it always will be Aboriginal land. I'm very, very pleased um, to have had the invitation today to, to speak to you about voluntary assisted dying in the ACT and the related very pertinent and very timely, um, more timely than I think any of us um, quite expected um, when the, the invitation was first issued regarding territory rights. Both of these are issues that I'm incredibly passionate about on both a professional level and a deeply personal one as well. And I, I know that these are feelings that are reflected right across the Canberra community. Can I also thank the association um, for making the time to have the conversation among many other issues uh, this week, and um, particularly across uh, your series of events. And more broadly, I want to acknowledge the association for its tireless work in supporting and developing health consumer perspectives and policy. And I want to acknowledge the detailed submission that was provided and the evidence given to the end of life choices inquiry that our assembly held in the last term of parliament, uh, central to which was that consumers should be the ultimate decision makers about their end of life care, as well as the need for end of life information to be accessible and plentiful, uh, something which this conversation is of course advancing today. And I very much look forward to working with the association over the coming months as we continue the conversation about territory rights and voluntary assisted dying. So I know that many of you who are listening today um, will know what voluntary assisted dying is, um, but to, to have, a, I guess, a, a bit of a shared definition as we go forward, um, voluntary assisted dying or VAD is about ensuring that we can die with dignity uh, and watch um, our loved ones uh, die with dignity. And it refers to the assistance provided by a health practitioner to a person to lawfully end the person's life with their free consent or voluntarily. It's also um, referred to as euthanasia or physician assisted suicide or dying, um, but the ACT government um, very deliberately does not uh, use euthanasia because it is a broad term that does have um, some broader implications for meaning, um, depending on, on your background and experience. And it can muddy um, some of the arguments. I believe the, the association's um, preferred terminology is termination of life on request. And I think that is very similar to voluntary assisted dying. You know, the intention of both of those terminologies uh, is the same, reflecting very importantly um, that the act in itself is voluntary. Um, but um, I'll, I'll keep using voluntary assisted dying and VAD today because that's what we use across government. So since 2017 to, to present day, every single state in Australia has legislated for a voluntary assisted dying scheme. Victoria was first in November 2017, Western Australia followed in 2019, um, no legislation was passed in 2020, but a lot of work uh, was progressed, including um, the bulk of an inquiry in Queensland and the drafting and introduction of legislation elsewhere. And so that's why last year in 2021, we saw a lot of states um, legislate voluntary assisted dying um, one after the other, first Tasmania in March, then South Australia, I think in June, and then Queensland in September. 
Then a private member's bill was introduced in New South Wales in late 2021, and it passed in May this year. So with all those very different timelines, only Victoria and Western Australia schemes are currently operational, um, but Tasmania is very soon to follow. While each state does have their own scheme, they are fairly similar. Um, it's generally acknowledged that the Victorian government scheme being the first has been the model and it has been built on uh, with some variations from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. States have defined VAD as the process of enabling a terminally ill person to access a life-ending substance if they are assessed as having at least one condition, illness or disease, which means they have, depending on the state and sometimes the condition, six to 12 months or less to live, that they're acting as importantly stressed voluntarily, that they have capacity, make persistent requests for VAD, and that they wish to en end their suffering, which cannot be relieved in any other way that the person finds tolerable. Each state's law sets up a process to authorise VAD, and this process involves the person generally making a number of formal requests for VAD, a doctor assessing the person's eligibility, getting a second opinion, uh, and then making arrangements um, to access a substance that can end the person's life, either by self-administration or administration by a health practitioner. All states, unsurprisingly, have a range of safeguards and legal requirements to protect a person against the abuse and misuse of the VAD system, including requiring independent witnesses for various parts of the process, requiring that second opinion, very strict training and qualification requirements for doctors, and uh, quite strict eligibility criteria for patients. States also all allow for conscientious objection. So that is that health practitioners may choose to conscientiously object from being involved in the process. But states do take quite varying approaches as to what a practitioner must do after they conscientiously object. So importantly, at the heart of each of these schemes is having a compassionate end of life experience. And importantly, and, and I think it should go without saying, um, but it does bear repeating that the existence of these schemes is about providing options, but it doesn't replace any healthcare option and especially does not replace palliative care. I think it is widely acknowledged in the medical profession that even the best palliative care does not alleviate suffering in around 5% of cases. And as the association highlighted in its submission to our end of life choices inquiry, VAD enables a person to choose a safe way to end their life. And without VAD, people are unfortunately uh, and quite tragically taking extraordinary and often counterproductive methods uh, to end their life. And that is true here in the ACT as it has been in other jurisdictions. Uh, and indeed, sadly, Unsuccessful attempts uh, by a person to end their own life may leave the individual in a worse condition, uh, while some methods um, can also be traumatising um, for family and friends and carers. And I did just want to speak quite briefly about some um, quite sensitive and personal experiences. And so uh, if anyone does wish to, to excuse themselves um, for about 90 seconds, um, that is um, very certainly um, fine uh, by me, but I don't expect to take any longer than, than 90 seconds. Um, but um, there are many conversations that I've had uh, with the community over um, many years. I've been a very public advocate for territory rights and voluntary assisted dying uh, before I was elected and, and especially after. Um, all of the experiences and stories uh, shared with me um, are absolutely tragic and the suffering I think has been um, very, very real um, and not only had a long and deep effect on the person, uh, but also their family members and friends and carers. And apart from that very real suffering um, of, of all the stories that I've um, been in a very privileged position to be trusted with and, and heard, um, there are two that really stick in my mind, which illustrate some of the broader issues in the absence of a voluntary assisted dying scheme. 
And something that I think about quite regularly is a card I once uh, cited um, that the family who received it then gave me permission to share. And the card was sent to this family um, with the authors um, stating, it was a, a very simple card, but stating that uh, this was their goodbye and that they were choosing to die by suicide and that they were sorry that they did not um, get a chance to say goodbye in person, um, but that had their friends known uh, that they would have been put in a very difficult position. And uh, especially with police. And I think about this often, um, that these people died alone uh, without their support networks, um, but they did so uh, because they did not want their friends and family uh, to be implicated. Whereas with the voluntary assisted dying scheme, their friends and family could have been uh, with them uh, at that time if they chose. And of course, the, the way that they died can also be very traumatic um, for those people who attend the scene, including first responders. And the AFP Association has just today uh, released a media statement in support of voluntary assisted dying and territory rights for the ACT in Northern Territory. And they've acknowledged the experiences of their members who attend these scenes. Um, there is also um, the, the story and experience uh, of Neil O'Riordan, um, which received quite a lot of media attention. Um, he was charged with one count of aiding the suicide um, uh, with the death of his partner, Penelope Bloom, who was suffering the advanced stages of motor neurone disease. Um, However, these charges, um, while they were laid, uh, they were dropped by the public prosecutor in 2019. So very recently, um, and the public prosecutor determined that those charges were not in the public interest because the consequences were unduly harsh and oppressive in the circumstances. But that uh, does not still take away from uh, the experiences uh, of Neil following uh, the death of, of his partner, Penelope. So both of those examples are in the media, um, and I'm very happy to provide uh, links in this chat if, it, if, if it's useful, but they've certainly left a very indelible uh, impression on me. So that brings, to me, uh, brings me uh, to why we don't have a voluntary assisted dying scheme here in the ACT, even though we know there is very strong support, incredibly strong support. Um, more than 80% of ACT residents support voluntary assisted dying. And that's even um, above the vote that we achieved in the, the ACT for, um, for um, marriage equality, uh, which was the highest in the country. So voluntary assisted dying gets even more support uh, than that for context. Um, and of course, um, given all states have legislated, why haven't we? And there is um, quite a lot of background uh, to this going back 27 years to 1995, which was when the Northern Territory became the first jurisdiction in the world, in the world uh, to introduce a legislated BAD scheme, uh, which was the, the rights of the terminally ill law. And in response to the passing of that law, Kevin Andrews, who was then the, the federal member for Menzies, indeed, uh, he's only just left parliament in the House of Reps, he introduced a private member's bill, the Euthanasia Laws Bill uh, in 1996 into the federal parliament. Uh, and it got um, very strong support in the House and quite uh, narrow support in the Senate, but nevertheless, it passed. And this bill is um, widely referred to um, thus as the Andrews Bill, um, and it amended the ACTs and the Northern Territories Self-Government Acts. And so um, this is getting into a bit of the, the technical detail, but it's important as to why we're different. But unlike the states, um, which are enshrined in the constitution, the ability for the ACT and the Northern Territory to govern ourselves comes from acts created in the federal parliament, the self-government acts. So the federal parliament can at any time amend our self-government acts to insert things in there or, or delete things out of it. So this was something that was inserted into there. It's very, very, very rare that they do this. Um, so essentially what it did was it, it banned the legislatures of the ACT, the Northern Territory and Norfolk Island from passing any legislation uh, relating to voluntary assisted dying. Uh, and it extinguished the Northern Territory's rights to the Terminally Ill uh, Act as well. So that 
ceased to exist. Um, so that bill passed in 1997, and here we are 25 years later with that ban uh, still in place. And I do think there is general acknowledgement that in 1995, the, the prospect of voluntary assisted dying was a lot uh, to contend with. But even with the federal laws which restricted us passing voluntary assisted dying in the territories, momentum continued to grow and grow from there across Australia. And there were 51 attempts to pass bills relating to voluntary assisted dying um, in, in the different states before Victoria was the first back in 2017. But all that time, territories have been fighting for our right to even consider uh, whether the community wants laws about voluntary assisted dying I'm very proud that the Northern Territory and ACT governments have been uh, continually advocating to restore our powers to legislate on this issue ourselves. And uh, I've been um, proud of my efforts as a, as a champion of this issue uh, over um, what's now become regrettably many years. Um, and I have used, I think it's safe to say, every mechanism uh, that has been uh, possibly available to me. Um, we've passed a remonstrance motion, which uh, damned essentially the Senate when they refused to um, give us our rights back in 2018. Um, that made history. We were the first um, parliament um, of any of the parliaments in the ACT to ever um, do that. Um, and I have to say the, um, it was a very paternalistic response that we got from the Senate uh, in response back then. Um, but four years later, I, I think it's fair to say I'm very pleased with the, uh, the momentum that our plight uh, has gathered. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that this is an issue that has been pursued by uh, many different people across um, different parties as well, uh, including in our uh, federal parliament going right back to Lynn Alliston and people like Richard Di Natale and of course uh, Katie Gallagher uh, and others. Um, but quite simply why this issue is um, such a, a frustrating one is that it, it renders the citizens of the territories as second class and it limits our ability to participate democratically uh, on something that is fundamentally important. And this does have a real human rights uh, issue to it because um, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Australia is a party to that. It guarantees citizens the right to take part in the conduct of public affairs. Um, and uh, that right should be realised, not just for some citizens in Australia, but all citizens in Australia. And personally, I think it's been very embarrassing on an international stage um, for the, the federal government to allow this legislation and this situation um, to persist. So that takes us to yesterday, uh, which was uh, with our, our federal government having committed uh, to legislation um, that took the form of a private member's bill, uh, championed and introduced into the House of Reps by Alicia Payne, our member for Canberra, uh, and Luke Gosling, uh, who is the member for Solomon in the Northern Territory. Um, a very simple bill, essentially about repealing those amendments to our Self-Government Act, restoring our rights to be able to decide legislation on voluntary assisted dying for ourselves. Um, so it's only just been introduced, debate continued uh, yesterday afternoon. We're currently at six speakers, four, and three speakers uh, against, and debate will continue again in the Federation Chamber um, this afternoon. We do expect that it will pass the House of Representatives, um, but it looks like it is going to be tighter uh, in the Senate. Um, but uh, we also expect that the vote in the House of Reps could be as early as this week, and that we would hope that a vote uh, would be held in the Senate by the end of this year. So I um, appreciate I've gone over time, um, but I'm happy to stay on a little bit longer. I'd also note that I would be eating into the next presentation, but happy to um, be guided here. But where to from here for the ACT? I'll, I'll speed through this a little bit, um, but I think we've been very public that in anticipation of our rights being restored, uh, we have begun work behind the scenes uh, on what a voluntary assisted dying scheme in the ACT could look like. So we've been doing a, a jurisdictional analysis, essentially looking at all the different schemes in the states, um, and puts us in a very good place about 
um, how those schemes are operating, where they are operating, uh, what works, where we might want to uh, improve. And then we're also um, drawing from that inquiry into end of life choices uh, that was held in the last term of parliament. But all of this work is to inform a consultation paper, which we would be hoping to release very soon after our rights are restored. So we're really trying to, to balance having a conversation here um, uh, but also moving uh, quite quickly with what we think are the key issues we want the, the public's feedback on um, once those rights uh, are restored. So I'm very grateful to officials who've been uh, working very hard uh, behind the scenes uh, on those things. Um, as I mentioned, the, the state schemes are generally very similar, um, but we know that there are some nuances that are worth exploring, um, things like the eligibility criteria to access um, the scheme, how conscientious objection would work in the ACT. I mentioned that conscientious objection is certainly supported, but then what happens after you object? Um, and uh, if you're a health practitioner, and if and how um, doctors could start a conversation about voluntary assisted dying. Um, so we'll make further announcements uh, about that timing, um, but that's a, a community conversation we're very much looking forward to have if and when, I hope, um, territory rights are restored. So my final, final point uh, is that, um, as I mentioned, while we're hopeful uh, of how the, the votes will be cast in the House of Representatives and the Senate, Nothing is guaranteed and I'm haunted, I'm literally haunted by what happened in 2018 when the vote in the Senate was lost 34 to 36. Um, so uh, you know, we just needed a few um, more senators to have voted a different way that would have gone to the House of Representatives and likely passed. And because it didn't, it, it set us back um, by four years. And this is our, the best chance that we've ever had but really, while we've got um, the support of all of our ACT federal representatives now, um, and at least most of the Northern Territory representatives, while Jacinta Price is yet to state her view, really the vast majority of people who are voting are from the states. Um, and some of them are acting you know, very paternalistic. Uh, if you look at some of the speeches that were given to us yesterday, including one MP from Queensland saying that um, the ACT couldn't be trusted uh, with making these laws because we don't have an upper house. But neither does Queensland. Uh, and Queensland passed its laws last year. So, um, you know, try to equate that. So this is what we're up against. So my plea to everyone here is if, if, if you would like rights restored, however you feel about voluntary assisted dying, you fundamentally agree about equal democratic rights, and I sincerely hope you do, um, please to talk to your family and friends in the states uh, and get them to lobby their local members uh, and senators, senators especially, um, to make this point and make them you know, talk about why their vote matters. Um, because if, we, if this fails by a few votes, um, I think we will all be... Um, uh, in a, in a very difficult position going forward, not least those um, very serious examples I, I spoke to before. So thank you for um, uh, letting me talk about something that is just um, so deeply held by me and um, something I'm very passionate about. Very happy to, to take uh, any questions and happy to stay on a bit longer, but I um, appreciate I don't want to eat into the next presentation either. Over to you, C, thank you. Thank you very much for that. I think we can forgive you for speaking a little over with all that passion. Um, does anyone have any particular questions they'd like to ask? You can use the Zoom function to raise your hand or physically raise your hand to give us a wave. Has anyone got one? Uh, Annika. Hello, thank you, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Tara. Um, I'm sorry, I can't figure out how to use my Zoom hand up. Um, Tara, I live in Darwin, so sort of absolutely what you're talking to obviously affects us here, very, you know, the same. Um, I was just wondering if you have, so I'm sort of um, doing end of life studies at the moment and keen to sort of ensure that I can connect with, I'm, I'm hoping the Northern Territory Government is doing similar to work to what the ACT is doing in sort of that preemptive work in the hope that the legislation passes. I'm just wondering, do you have any leading that from an NT government point of view who I might be able to connect with? Uh, yes, happy to, to talk to you um, yeah. uh, offline and, and provide that, but it, it would be led by um, the Attorney General, which is um, Chanty. Um, uh, so, uh, and and um, 
uh, the previous Attorney General and I worked quite closely in our lobbying efforts, especially last year on, on the federal government. So that's okay. where it would be. I and think that's Natasha Fyre, just, just next door to me. So that's good. Yes. <laughs> Um, and so I, uh, I think the Northern Territory is in a, a slightly different um, position. Um, you know, they did have an act, but I think they've made clear already that this wouldn't be an act that they would seek to just reintroduce as it was. Yeah. A lot has changed. So they would need to have that conversation again. And I know that they would, um, there's very strong push to have a very long and, and detailed conversation with the Indigenous communities as well, which I know would be very, very welcome. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for that, Annika. Um, Sonia. Thank you. Thanks, Tara, for a really informative presentation. There's a lot there and you were able to succinctly bring it all together in such a short time. And look, thank you for all your work. I'm, um, I'm at Canberra Grief Centre and I guess my question is, um, if this fails and we don't get the votes, do you see opportunity for... ACT consumers to um, to in, to engage the New South Wales scheme because I imagine the legislation is wrapped around the process in New South Wales, but then you can take um, you know you can take vacation back to your own home in the ACT and and you know that that can be above board because it's all been process through the New South Wales scheme. I mean, do you see opportunity to work with New South Wales in that way? Uh, yes, definitely. So um, on a, a few different levels. So my number one um, goal is to get territory rights restored um, for, for all of the human rights uh, issues that are associated with it. Um, and, and if that proceeds, as I very much hope it does, I think uh, us looking to where we can align as much as possible with the New South Wales scheme um, makes a lot of sense, um, particularly given our, our cross-border uh, interests. Um, if territory rights doesn't proceed, uh, there are a few different um, uh, ways we could take this. And I, I am reluctant to, to go into hypotheticals, but there is something that has missed a lot of people's attention is that um, most of the schemes have residency requirements. So that, um, so Victoria, for example, you need to live in Victoria for at least 12 months before you can access the scheme. But the uh, New South Wales scheme and the Queensland scheme both provide for that a person can apply for an exemption to the local residency scheme uh, or local residency requirement if they have a close or a substantial connection to the state. Um, so that's something that has missed a lot of people's uh, attention, for better or worse. And I think how that actually operates for us here in the ACT uh, would probably need to be tested um, yeah. because what is a, a close or a substantial connection? I think all of us in the ACT would say, well, we're very close um, in proximity, um, but you know, you might not have a family member there and, and potentially on how it's interpreted, you then might be excluded. Uh, and then so we really would start to have a whole lot of different sets of classes of citizens within the ACT. But that's something that I think we could work on um, and, and depending on how that's interpreted, seek to engage with the New South Wales government um, further on. But I would note mm. that the New South Wales scheme was introduced by a private member, um, did not have the support of the Premier. Um, and so... Uh, engaging with the, the government uh, is a going to be slightly different conversation uh, with a, a conservative government there. So yeah. essentially there, there are options um, available to us, but firmly focused on territory rights. Yeah, lovely. Thanks, Tara. Thank you so much and a, a great question, Sonia. Mm. Are there any more questions from the group? I don't think I see any. Okay. Well, in that case, thank you very much, Tara, for, for that. That was really informative and really timely. And I think I speak for all of us to say that we hope that this progresses um, well, the, the way that uh, you've said. So thank you so much for your time today, uh, acknowledging that it's a very busy one. And we'll move on to our oh, next. Thank you, Sue. Yeah.
So thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks everyone for having me. And and I'll just put a few links in the the chat um, to if people want to read anything further. Okay. And I'll include those in the email out afterwards. Ah, as well. Brilliant. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day.